Hello and welcome to the Final Fantasy Entertainment and Podcast Network. I am your host, the warrior of hype, Daniel. And joined with me today is a very special guest who will be providing a detailed analysis of the music in Final Fantasy VII Remake that enhances the story through foreshadowing, telegraphing, and reinforcing ideas. Stephen Pollard, uh, it is a privilege to provide you with the platform to share your findings. Uh, how are you today, man? Oh, I'm doing just fine. I'm actually really excited to be here, so... <laughs> Nice. Uh, yeah. man, uh, um, uh, you reached out to us and, uh, and that was, that was in itself was an honor. Um, you wanted to be able to share your findings and, uh, with, with your detailed music analysis, you didn't really want to start your own channel and that's understandable. It is, a, <laughs> uh, it's a lot of hard work. Um, Monumental undertaking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, I'm honored that you chose final fan TV to share your findings here. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to ask you, uh, like, uh, what, like, kind of moved you to do this detailed analysis absolutely so this is something i have been thinking about since at least the beginning of february um even before integrate was announced um if anybody's keeping keeping track of the timeline so um i so i will i'll preface by saying i have been a final fantasy fan for almost two decades um and i have been a um i've been playing music for my basically my entire life um so Obviously, I really do have an appreciation for music. Um, I also really have a fascination with storytelling. And so with my love of music and storytelling, the idea of like, you know, music and film, TV, video games, whatnot, um, is really fascinating to me. So, um, you know, I, I've been watching a lot of uh, content about like, you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake and, and kind of uh, Easter eggs and stuff. And I will give a shout out to uh, uh, content creator uh, MJ Gallagher here because uh, his Easter egg series is is phenomenal uh, through KukuCon. If you have not seen it, here's my official endorsement of it. Um, for whatever that means, nobody knows who I am. So <laughs> might not count for much. But um, so I was um, thinking about the music and, and also watching videos about um, how you know, film scores are used and stuff. And, and was just thinking like, hmm, like anytime I start thinking about stories, I go to Final Fantasy VII because it's very important to me, obviously. But um, so I'm like, hmm, I wonder if anybody is doing content on how Final Fantasy VII Remake is using music. Um, and I did not find anything. I was so surprised. I mean, yeah. you can find anything on the internet and I couldn't find anything about this. Um, I even reached out to a couple of content creators for Final Fantasy VII Remake uh, and asked like, hey, do you guys know anybody who's doing this kind of stuff? Literally everybody was like, uh, not, not specifically what you're talking about. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's no like, there's no videos out there that are discussing the stuff we're going to be discussing today um if there is like if anybody finds that kind of stuff definitely let me know because i'm super interested in it mm -hmm. but because nobody because i didn't see anybody doing this i'm like here's a like this is a need that like this is something that needs to be addressed like this is a need that we have to fill and i've done that a couple of other times with other final fantasy 7 related stuff but not very often so um because there is so much out there so that's kind of how i got this idea but it's been kicking around since the beginning of the year so it's it's been a long time coming really excited really excited to hear what you got <laughs> um so yeah uh before we begin um getting really into the uh into the nitty-gritty of this conversation i guess uh is there any kind of like terminology that uh like that the listeners will need to know that's a way where everybody's on the same page such as uh like musical uh terminology to better understand things Absolutely. So there will be a couple of uh, things I'm things I'm going to a uh, couple of ter terms I'm going to throw out there. Before I do that, I will just give a quick kind of overview because I do want to set um, just kind of a good expectation of what to expect. So we are going to be discussing music in Final Fantasy VII Remake specifically. Mm -hmm. um, we are going, like you like you had said at the beginning, we are going to talk about you know how the music how the music helps tell the story, how it foreshadows, um, how it you know telegraphs, reinforces idea, all that all ideas, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we are going to have a pretty heavy emphasis on like versions of original themes that were used in remake because um, Final Fantasy VII Remake has that um, has that benefit of being you know a later installment and in a well established franchise where um, where it can use those. Um, so we're going to do that. You know, if we if we have time, there are some like kind of little Easter egg things that I can discuss too. And um, I will kind of lean a little bit on like 
other other aspects of remake like you know kind of some visual cues dialogue um we're going to talk a little bit about what's in the uh ultimanias um but we are going to use the music as a baseline for all this so this is a very music-based discussion um and it will be a broad overview i did i did kind of get some stuff on twitter about people um seeming to have interest in like hey they switched from a major key to a minor key and like key signatures and stuff so it kind of became an issue of like do i want to discuss that and just do a couple of themes because like you have to really you know, dig deep into that kind of stuff or do i want to be able to cover like kind of the whole game and discuss more broadly like how this is telling the story i did go with the latter so i hope everybody's okay with that um if you're really interested in the former like digging deep into that kind of stuff please let me know i don't have a huge audience <laughs> myself so like tweet me comment let me know here and in, in chat if you're if you're tuning in live i will um I'm happy to do that kind of stuff. I just didn't feel like there was much of an audience for it. So yeah, and I mean, there uh, is, it, the the handle is right below the video tile there, yeah. so you can you can uh, use that to, to find yeah. them on Twitter. Um, and then also, I mean, hey, if you want to come back, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll 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 discuss that if we get if we get interest in this. But like, you yeah. have to you guys have to let me know because like, if the, if if I don't feel like it's worth it, I'm not gonna do it. If yeah. you really want to hear about it though, I I'm happy to do that kind of stuff. But you gotta let me know. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, that all all of that being said, there's there's two Two other caveats I want to give before we get into the terminology. I do apologize that I'm rambling, but um, <laughs> the uh, we are, like I said, we're specifically talking about remake. So we are not going to discuss any other Final Fantasy VII music unless it appears in remake. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, that means no Crisis Core, which spawns me out because I love Crisis Core's music. No Before Crisis, um, no Dirge Servers. Um, and on the note of Dirge Servers, we are also not going to talk about intermission today. We are talking about the base game um there were reasons why i i chose not to do intermission um they may have actually used themes from their servers i honestly don't know because i'm not familiar with their servers soundtrack because i haven't played the game in many 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 years hmm. um but the lead composer for remake was also the composer for Dirge servers if anybody doesn't know so yeah. i would not be surprised if he used some music in intermission i would actually think it would be a huge missed opportunity if they didn't but um we're we're talking about the base game here um and we will talk a little bit about intergrade but not intermission um so all that being said to finally answer your question terms <laughs> that we are going to discuss and i will be very very brief if there's any um you know professionally educated like um you know formally educated you know musicians or whatever please don't hate me i'm just going with very brief broad descriptions here so you will hear me talk about theme so this is the um a theme or a subject sometimes you hear it called as the primary piece of melodic information uh, that's contained within a piece of music you can think of it as the main melody um so if you're listening to like the main theme of final fantasy 7 you know the da, 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 you know that that's that's what we're talking about and uh, by the way i cannot sing worth a crap so <laughs> sorry guys um and so with a theme it can represent something specific you know, like a character or an idea does not have to though. It can just be a broad thing to represent, you know, Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably hear me use the terms track or or piece of music or just piece. Um, those all for, for purposes of this discussion mean the same thing. Um, you will not really hear me talk about a song too much. A song is actually, um, people will call themes songs, but a song is actually, um, music written specifically for the human voice. So Hollow, the, the theme song for Final Fantasy VII Remake, is a song because Yosh, um, or Yosh, I don't know how it's pronounced, from uh, right. Survives of the Prophet did the uh, did the vocals. So that was written specifically to have a human voice. So you probably won't hear me use the term song as much, but theme, song, whatever, whatever you know, mental connection you make is fine. Okay. Um, Compo uh, we'll, we'll talk a little about compositions, which is just an original piece of music written by somebody, the composer. So um, an arrangement, you'll hear me talk, use the word arrangement a lot. That just means um, a rendition of a pre-existing piece of music. So music that was used in the original game, like Tifa's theme, they did arrangements for Final Fantasy VII Remake. So they just did new versions of it with orchestras or piano, whatever, because the original soundtrack, as I'm sure most people know, was just like synth. It was like MIDI files. So they didn't use actual instruments. So that's what a remake is you can think of it as like a cover or a remix i guess mm -hmm. um and um you can actually if you go and look at the liner notes for the for the soundtracks you can see you can easily identify what's an arrangement by seeing that the composer's name is nobu amatsu who did the original soundtrack 
he, the only theme that he composed for the for remake was hollow but he is still credited as a composer for a lot of the music because he was the composer and but you'll see that the arranger is you know Masashi Hamauzu or whoever else um, last two themes, I'll, I'll be very quick with these. Motif, you might hear me say this a couple times, it is like a very small snippet of music that can contain thematic information, but it cannot represent a specific thing. So it can't represent a character or an idea. Okay. By contrast, a late motif is the same thing, except it must represent something in a narrative. So a per person, place, idea, event, whatever. Um, to give a good example, the Force in Star Wars has its own has its own mm, late motif. Yes, uh, you know the da na 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 na. Oh yeah, you um, from from a uh, theme called Binary already. Sunset. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can hear it when Luke is staring out at the binary sunset. New Hope. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll give a better example from uh, Divinity Two from Advent Children. So we're going to talk about that very briefly before I dive in. Um, there is a very specific piece. Um, this is the scene where Cloud is jumping up to kill Bahamut Trimmer and like everybody's grabbing his hands, tossing them in the air, higher, higher, higher. And then he runs into the flare. I think it's called like, you know, Petaflare or something like that, yeah, that flare thing. And then, you know, Aerith, come, you know, you see her hand reach out and she says, let's go Cloud. Yeah. When that, like when she does that, you hear her kind of theme. That is her late motif. Like it's you know, um, I can't hum it very well, but that is that's what a late motif is. So it's it's a different theme. It's called Divinity Two, but her specific late motif is just built into that theme. So um, that is all the terminology. I hope I didn't lose anybody because I know that's kind of the boring stuff. But I swear everything else is more interesting. <laughs> no, that's also I'm actually playing Divinity in the background right now. And okay, I'm, try I'm trying to find that uh, Aerith part. Um, I believe it happens a little later on in the song, right? It's it's close to the end because it's right before he uh, right before he uses Clem Hazard to to kill Bahamut. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, just for anybody listening, he can hear the music. I can't right now. <laughs> so if you if you throw like, why is he not talking about? Yeah, that's why. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. So I'll just let it play in the background. It'll, it'll come up. Fine um awesome yeah so thank if, you, if you get to that part you just stop me and be like hey everybody listen to this part this is her like <laughs> all right um yeah that's awesome i learned learned a lot just from that oh here it is here it is i believe that's it right there yeah all right so <laughs> sweet oh, all right go. that's so, what a late motif is so then it goes it starts with divinity 2 plays her late motif and then it goes back into the music so that's that's a that's a good example of late motif awesome there. okay yeah. so there's the uh there's that. I'm going to pause that real quick. Um, so now we're going to move on uh, to let's talk about some of the things that you mentioned here. Let's talk about themes. Uh, that, that was one of the uh, one of the, the terminologies that you mentioned. Um, and one theme that is like it's been, it's just rearranged so many times uh, is ex anxiety. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. if I could talk anxiety. Um, and if you want to talk about a little bit about those uh, multiple arrangements there. Mm -hmm. um yeah go ahead absolutely um so i will say personally for me anxiety i love this theme i loved it when i played the original game it kind of like is a good representation of me to what final fantasy 7 is like it's a very melancholy theme and i think the atmosphere of of the first of the original game is very melancholy you know mm -hmm. there's a lot of loss a lot of death a lot of you know bad stuff happening um, I mean, it even has kind of a dour ending, right? So mm -hmm. I, just for me personally, I love this theme. Um, so I was happy to see it recreated and remake the way it was. Um, now, the first time you hear this theme is actually during um, chapter one. So it actually is introduced in remake a little bit earlier than it is in the original game where you first hear it after escaping Marco Reactor 1 when you read Sector 8. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but the first arrangement of anxiety um, happens during the flashback in chapter one when Jesse is asking Cloud about Tifa and how he knows her. Um, he says, uh, you know, he doesn't say anything. He, you know, his mind goes back and um, he remembers, you know, walking out of his house and Tifa saying something to him. Um, and actually confirmed in the Ultimania as well as the end credits, um, they're like eight years old. So um, this was one that actually kind of struck me on replays where I was like, hmm, that's funny because Tifa and Cloud weren't friends when they were mm. when they were eight years old, right? Like uh, if you played the original game, by the way, we're gonna be talking about spoilers if you didn't know. 
<laughs> so when uh when they were eight years old they weren't friends so it got me thinking and then i went and listened to i went and looked up the, the name of the theme so there's two soundtracks two main soundtracks for remake you have the original soundtrack and you have what's called the original soundtrack plus and this mm -hmm. is not in the original soundtrack it's in plus mm -hmm. and now you have intergrade so there's actually three but um <laughs> there's a lot of music in this game um so the theme is called anxiety false memories um if you've if you've been keeping up with Audrey on Twitter, her Ultimania Plus translations, she translated it as anxious heart fake memories. So that might be a more accurate translation. But um, anyway, so they confirmed in this uh, in the Ultimania Plus that the that the subtitle false memories alludes to the fact that Cloud uh, that the memory he's having of Tifa here is not real. So this was something I thought before. Like I actually started looking to this and like, I wonder if this is a real memory. And um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. But then the Ultimania Plus came out and I know I told you, Daniel, I sent you like, I was like, dude, look at these notes that I took. <laughs> like, I I wish I had said this before um, so that I could be like, hey, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but my my point here is really just that um, the, sub, the, the titles of the themes matter a lot. So we're gonna talk a lot about hey, here's the name of the theme. And it does matter as they confirmed in the Ultimania Plus that false memories allude to the fact that this isn't a real memory. Um, Tifa was eight, they were not friends. He is not remembering things accurately. We know if you play the original game that he has, that he, he his memory is unreliable. Mm -hmm. he, doesn't, he doesn't remember everything correctly. Now, as some additional proof, I did look at the visuals for this. So there is a color gradient over this scene it kind of has like um kind of like a brownish kind of mm -hmm. tinged over over the scene now this happens a lot in his like you know you have those moments kind of like an avid children where he has a like brain glitch where it's like dzz, dzz, you know and kind of buzzes or whatever mm -hmm. um he doesn't have that here but he does have the color gradient so it's like okay so it seems like he's remembering something that's kind of true but also kind of not because there's a color gradient if you compare that to the water tower flashback in chapter four it's a smooth segue it's no it's colored normally there's no gradient so i was like the fact that there isn't this scene and there isn't in that one leads me to believe there's something more going on and then they confirmed that and so i'm like yeah. okay so this stuff matters like the the way that the visuals are being depicted the way that they're naming the themes all of this stuff really bad they thought a lot about this and it's really cool um and so that's really all i have to say about that particular theme um or about that arrangement of it now there are a few others um there's one in chapter seven, um, it's titled, I'm sick of all of this, which comes from a line that Tifa speaks. Um, it contains some of anxiety mixed with other stuff in the theme. And it, that's, that plays during the Mako Reactor 5 flashback when he remembers Tifa picking up Sephiroth's sword and running off. Um, that is kind of an Easter egg too, because anxiety is the background music that plays in Nibelheim in the original game, for anybody who doesn't remember. Um, we also get a couple of other arrangements of it. Um, there's one that plays at the end of chapter two when Jesse's showing Cloud the map. Um, and that may serve as an Easter egg as well because anxiety first plays when they reach sector eight. So, you know, sort of similar. Um, and then, yeah, and then it plays in sector five as well. Um, you hear two arrangements of it in sector five. That again, kind of calls back to sector eight because that's the theme that's playing when you first meet Aerith in the original game. And then it plays in sector five while you're with Aerith. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that theme pops up every now and again. Um, it's not the one that is, that is arranged the most. We'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> Um, but I will say just, just talking about the water tower theme real quick. Um, there is the, the theme that plays, it's called a tower of promise mm -hmm. for anybody interested. That is an arrangement of a theme called dear to the heart from the original game. Um, now this is not a cloud and Tifa centric theme. It's actually a theme that typically plays during scenes when the whole party is together. Mm -hmm. Um, you first hear it right after you get out of Midgar. And this is uh, like when you're choosing your party, like, hey, is, you know, is Claude going to go with Tifa and yeah, Tifa like and Barrett? Or yeah, yeah, where you choose like the three that you split into teams of three and two, and then you go to Calm. Mm -hmm. It plays during that scene for anybody who's who's interested. Wow. Um, so this is yeah. a, a Tower of Promise. Um, okay, so it's a kind of like a rendition of that, of the original. Yeah, oh, okay. and, and it contains the motif from the main theme. So, you know, like it, it's, it, it ties in to, to that quite a bit. 
Um, but I, I had hoped that they would kind of do like a medley of like the main theme, which is kind of representative of Cloud and like Tifa's theme, but you know, mm. they wanted to put me, I think they just wanted to like use a lot of the music from the original game and, but arrange it in neat ways. So um, it does that. The only other thing that I would have to add to this particular part of the discussion, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> is um, there is also a theme. It took me a long time to figure this out. I had to listen to this theme on its own away from the game without the dialogue and stuff. There's a theme that plays at the very end of chapter eight called Bitter Memory. Um, this theme plays when Cloud is having the, uh, the memory or the flashback where he's talking to, where his mother is talking to him about like, you should find a, a girl who, you know, like is older and can mm -hmm. keep you in line, all that kind of stuff. Um, this took me a little while to figure out because it's a very loose arrangement, but there's a theme from the original game called Other Side of the Mountain. It plays during the memory reconstruction scene in the live stream when Tifa is helping Cloud put back together his memories. And it kicks in during the scene where Tifa is in her bedroom crying because her mother just died. And I found that interesting that, uh, first of all, both of these things take place in Nibelheim. Um, these are both centered on mothers in a way, and um, they both involve memories of the characters. So this kind of is, a, is an example of like how it's either really shocking coincidence or they really thought this stuff out. Mm. And people have talked a lot about how much they think about this, uh, how, yeah. how much thought went into this. And it's just, I had to call that out because I just was like, oh man, that's so brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, really cool stuff there. Uh, so and then we're going to talk, talk a little bit more about uh, the connections too. Um, so you mm -hmm. made a lot of connections with um, with Cloud and Tifa, uh, even going back to some connections with um, <laughs> Tifa and Nibelheim. Uh, yeah. the, so let's go ahead, and now I see that you want to talk about a connection between Barrett and Shinra. Uh, uh, so, yes. so that should be interesting to hear. Uh, so I love to hear for those like those those musical cues that tell a story within itself. Um, so when you hear these connections, uh, it's just always fascinating. Um, so, what are your examples of Barrett and right. Shinra? I'm excited. Right. So I think I, I think I put in my notes. I, I titled it Barrett Shinra. Like Barrett Shinra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Barrett Shinra. So so I and I promise, like I, I feel like we're getting from like the least interesting to the most interesting topics here. Mm. So I think this one's pretty interesting. So um there are a couple of things and most of this actually happens in chapter two so we're going to start there the very first thing you hear in chapter two is shinra's theme you hear like they go through the tunnel they come out you see all of sector eight on fire right and then shinra's theme kicks in now the very obvious connection here is that this theme is playing because we're standing among the ruins of shinra because as we know uh shinra actually blew up the reactor like the jesse's bomb didn't do crap and then shinra came in and he's like hey we're just gonna blow this up and you know we're gonna use this as our way to start a war restart the war through Utai, or in the ceasefire rather i guess anyway that's the obvious connection however we do have some interesting stuff going on in the scene because first of all Cloud and Barrett and Avalanche, they're our point of view characters in the scene. They have no idea that Shinra did this. They think this is their doing. They're coming out here like, holy crap, look at what we did. And that's obviously a big point of, of, of especially Jesse's art. Um, and so they're, you know, you compare this kind of stuff to, I'm, I'm going to use Star Wars a lot. I know that you're, you're kind of like Star I'm, Wars. Too, I'm so. all about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's go, man. Let's use some Star so, Wars references. <laughs> so, I, so first off, I'll say you would expect, okay, so we go from there to like them, you know, seeing all this stuff on fire. We launch into one of Barrett's many um, tyriads about like, oh, this is why we're doing this stuff. Like, you know, we got to save the planet, all that kind of stuff. And I love those scenes with him. But we launch into one of his big grand speeches here. So... Mm -hmm ordinarily during these type of moments you hear the theme for the character in question that's like doing this barrett does have his own theme in the original game mm -hmm. um but we don't hear that here it's it, it, we don't like a lot of the themes in the game are medleys where they go from like it's focusing on sephiroth and then it moves into you know Aerith's theme because we're, we're, we're focused on air this one stays with shinra's theme like, we don't move into we don't move into barrett's theme here um and I kind of compare that to like, this would be like if the Rebel Alliance is talking about taking down the Empire, 
we don't hear the Imperial March playing over this. You know, we hear like the Force theme or, or you know, some Rebel, mm -hmm. you know, some a lot Rebel Alliance centric theme. There's some and kind of medley going on. Yeah, right? yeah. You, you don't. It's not just like playing. You know, dun 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 dun. dun. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's not playing that while they're talking about like, yeah, let's take down these SOBs. <laughs> um, and, and you know, and then like, you know, when Anakin and the in the prequel trilogy, like, you know. Like when he's on screen, it's not like the Imperial March is playing the whole time. We only hear it during moments where it's like foreshadowing his darker side to you know drop hints that he's going to become Vader. Um, but we don't get it. It just stays with Shinra's theme. Mm -hmm. So That's my it. kind of my kind of thought is that this scene is actually meant to represent Barrett's similarity to Shinra mm. because while he is ideologically opposed to them the way that he decides to carry this out a lot is very much in line with how Shinra behaves you mirror this to the scene in chapter 17 when he meets Shinra in his office mm -hmm. you know Shinra's like I do whatever you know I see what I want I take it and then we look at this scene and Barrett's talking about like man we're gonna you know we're gonna blow up more reactors we're gonna you know kill more people and we're gonna we're gonna keep doing it and we're we're just gonna do it because we have to save the planet these aren't these are not dissimilar sentiments like they are they want different things but they are both saying that they're willing to go to literally whatever links they have to to get it um they don't you know and and literally both of them are not thinking about human lives like barrett knows that you know blowing up the reactor kill people and he's saying we're gonna do it again Shinra doesn't care about killing people clearly because he wasn't going to actually blow up the reactor. And so that made me start thinking about, hmm, okay, so Barrett dies in, in Shinra's office right after Shinra does, and then he's resurrected. Hmm. So this is just kind of a question I'm posing. I don't really have an answer to this, but like, are they going to use his death? Yeah, he did die, but he was resurrected. Is that going to symbolically kind of be a turning point in his character arc? Hmm. to where like his the side that side of him yeah. this vindictive i will do whatever i have to to take down shinra even if it kills people is this side of him did this die with with his first death and is his resurrection going to be a kind of rebirth for his character and and you know you think of like this also takes place right after he has this confrontation with the president hmm. yeah i mean that's that's a good <laughs> question uh, that that is good i like that uh i like that question you raised uh because he does have that conversation with President Shinra, and like I think that moment he kind of gets, you know, like a, a eye-opening moment. Like, right? It's just kind of the, he, he I, hears I hope so. himself, <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. like maybe he hears himself through that, and then maybe some some yeah. of the words that President Shinra like uh, said kind of struck a chord because I, it's like, I ooh. think that yeah, I think that would be a very clever tack for mm -hmm. for Square for the for part two is that like we see this shift in him. And yeah. like maybe maybe we even enter like his own mind where he gets a flashback where he's like thinking about that and then kind of hearing like his own voice over the president's or something you know like hearing his you know the president's words and then his like overdub like something like that yeah. like i think would be would be really cool and i'm either i'm either looking way too much into this which is entirely possible because you know like there were there were theories out there about like oh rufus must be etc because he can see the whispers and then they're like oh yeah he just touched cloud during you know when they were fighting <laughs> like and, and like oh yeah you know the sector five church i think is you know must be about minerva and then they're like oh no they just built that like 30 years ago for the people you know like <laughs> they're just casually dismissing yeah, things cool. that people want to spend like hours on youtube talking about and so maybe i'm just looking too much into it but yeah. i I'm, I'm curious to see if this turns out to be like a kind of a turning point for his character yeah, if you because like look it, at it, it and then like looking at it uh as remake part one is a standalone game <laughs> Then, like, if, if, like, if you want to look at it as that, just, sure. just to kind of contain the story, I guess, right? It's definitely not, hopefully, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, let's, let's, de yeah, it's definitely setting up a part yeah, two. It's, 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 it's <laughs> but every character, every character kind of goes through an arc, at least some kind of like a semi arc, right? Like, in, yeah. in part one. Um, so, sure. um, yeah, I mean, like, to see that evolution of Barrett, something's got to put him on a path. Yeah. Um, so any anybody who can come up with some kind of explanation to make that scene okay for me, 
<laughs> like you know what I mean? I just I just do not like the, the Barrett death. So um I don't either. I, I think it, <laughs> I I will not get off on a tangent on this too much, but I it goes into a larger problem about like I'm worried that they are undoing this whole theme of like the heart and soul of the game is uh, of the original game is loss. Mm, right. So that and, is and that and that cool. manifests that manifests most emotionally and prominently through obviously deaths mm -hmm. so like they telegraphed oh barrett died and resurrected and then right after that we learn all this stuff that, like oh crap characters are coming back to yeah, life fake out deaths so um, i'm i'm worried about that but like that would be a good way to justify it is that like his death has purpose because it's it's a, like kind of like a symbolic death and resurrection i think that's yeah that's the only way for me because i'm with you I, did, I didn't like that but but I like where you're going with it. It definitely feels like, uh, you know, like president, like that's the death of the old Barrett. Let's like now he's on He's, he's on a new mission, right? Like it would be, a, it would be a good, it would be a good mind. way. It would be a good way to utilize that. Same yeah. Thing. All right. I like that. That's a, that's cool. Um, a cool way to yeah. take the music, um, you know, com comparing, um, yeah. Shinro with Barrett, uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I will say we were, we were, so we're talking about chapter two, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first theme. Now the very last theme is uh shining beacon of civilization, which is one of the themes of anxiety where, you know, Jesse's mapping out the, the thing for cloud on the train, but the second to last theme that cut. And so these kind of bookend, like we start with Shinra's theme and then we almost end with a theme called Shinra Creed. Now, I, this has been pointed out before. This is a, an arrangement of a theme called Mark of a Traitor, which is from the original game, and it plays as the background music in North Corral. So this is a very Barrett-centric theme. The original mm. theme actually, well, and actually even the arrangement contains uh, Barrett's leitmotif in it. Like, so his, you know, the part, like, if you go listen to his theme from the original game and then listen to Mark of a Traitor, you are going to hear, like, part like some of the notes and chords from his theme playing repeating in here um but we don't have his theme in this game we just have this so mm. it now this could be this could have been so this plays let me say where this plays this plays in chapter two when barrett is accosting the middle manager and his and his friends on the train mm -hmm. he's like oh yeah well avalanche you know they're, they're they stand for you know, and then they're like well you know we're we stand up for what's right and then they like run off to the next cart because you know <laughs> this big guy with a gun is is like is like bullying them <laughs> so this this may just be played just because it's a barrett centric scene and they wanted to use a theme that was related to him um but his theme is a little bit his theme is one that kind of stands out in the original game so maybe they just felt like they couldn't arrange it in a way that it would fit in well i don't know mm -hmm. but the title is not mark of a traitor it's not you know barrett bullies you know shinra or whatever <laughs> it's sh it is called shinra creed and this shinra this <laughs> this title comes from a line that at least in the english version where one of the characters says like you know, we stand up for what's right. And, you know, we stand up for the civilized people. You know, this is the Shinra creed. Um, so that's where the theme comes from. So it seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, it seems to be coming from, it's actually like referencing the Shinra employees rather than Barrett. Yeah. Which is interesting because it is a Barrett centric theme. So again, we have a tie in with Barrett kind of compared to Shinra, although this time the corporation rather than the man. And, you know, they run off like right after this whole ordeal. They run off and you know, flee to the next train. They they make it pretty clear in this scene that they know who Barrett is. Like he is very clearly Avalanche, you know? He's like, oh yeah, you know, Avalanche. And he's got a freaking gun on his arm. Like they know this guy's Avalanche, but then they, they talk about, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna stand up for people and then they run. And then they run. Yeah, very interesting <laughs> there. Very so you yeah, so you tie it back into the original name of the theme, the original theme, Mark of a Traitor. They're kind of betraying what they just said they stood for. Mm. So maybe that's a thing. It could also have just been selected to represent Barrett's betrayal of Corel to Shenra and kind of juxtaposing that with the Shenra employee's betrayal of their own company. Um, but it also does serve as a callback to the original game. It's kind of an Easter egg as well, where um, they uh, it play that theme actually... Um, um, or, or not that theme, but Barrett's theme plays during the segment where you first meet the middle manager and uh, on the way to Mako Reactor 5 in the original game. So it could also be like a nice Easter egg. Oh, hey, the first time they meet the middle manager because mm -hmm. it's playing Barrett's theme at that point. Um, 
Yeah, and then it's also used, I mean, it could also be used as foreshadowing to kind of like show like, oh yeah, we're going to telegraph, you know, Barrett's turn and the theme may pop up in part two. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then I will just point out that it's also used for uh, Kyrie's scene in uh, Aerith's church in chapter 14. I have no idea why they use it there. Maybe because she's, you know, kind of a traitor to her own people. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting that it's called the Shinra Creed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, that's, uh, that's... Uh, I, that's interesting. Like you said, the Shinra Creed is the, uh, you know, standing up for people and stuff. Um, and it plays at the weirdest parts. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 very cool. I mean, um, it does have that, like, it does have that kind of... Bounty. Uh, like, this is, is a fun, you know, bounty type thing. Yeah, it's, it's a more like It's a comedy mo uh, moment that's going yeah. on, I guess. But uh, interesting that they call it the Shinra Creed. Um, yeah, like I said, the, th the titles matter. So I'm looking under the stuff and I'm like, hmm, like, is this referencing bears or referencing that? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of these Advent children uh, connections that you've been making. Um, so obviously there's a lot of theories going on that uh, Advent children, or this, you know, remake takes place after Advent children, but. You know, it's like a, a requel or whatever you want to call it. Um, so <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of theories like that. Um, so in this sense, uh, Advent Children has happened um, in a way for at least for for maybe for Sephiroth, Sephiroth and Aerith, <laughs> right? Yeah, for Sephiroth yeah. and Aerith, you know, this Advent Absolutely. Children and all that other stuff has happened. Um, so to have some musical tie-ins, um, very interested in see what you came up with that. <sighs> Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about Sephiroth's scene. For, actually, do you mind if I grab a water real quick? You go I'm, right ahead. Not, all right, I'll be back in two seconds. Yeah, That's yeah, right. go right ahead. Um, so this is very interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> as we're talking about the Final Fantasy VII Remake music analysis here, what do you guys think? You guys, are you are you enjoying the analysis right now? Um, the Barrett and Shinra connection was interesting for me. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of like, you know, that whole juxtaposition. Final Fantasy has done this so many times where you take the you know a protagonist and you kind of mix it with an antagonist uh yuna and seymour is an, is an example of that yeah. so like to kind of have that juxtaposition uh in place with barrett i found that very interesting um but now that you're back let's go <laughs> ahead and let's go ahead and talk about that advent children all right so before we get on to advent children we're going to talk a little bit about sephiroth's themes so mm. The very first time we hear this is during chapter one when he sees the black feather you know, floating down when he's about to set the bomb. Um, you hear a little piano. Now this is Sephiroth's late motif here. Um, and then shortly after in chapter two, we hear um, his actual theme, which is not one winged angel. Everybody thinks his theme is one winged angel. His theme is not one winged angel. So one winged angel was the boss battle theme for Safer Sephiroth. Um, and it now kind of functions as his, as his theme because of how popular it is. And so now it's used to represent him in Kingdom Hearts, Smash right. Brothers, etc. So it has kind of retroactively like been used to be his theme, but the character's actual theme is a theme called Those Chosen by the Planet. It's the one that has like the, bah, yeah, the gong and then the doom, doom. Yeah. Doom, and then you hear the, doo, doo, doo. yeah. Um, which, dude. you know, has like, which is related to One Wing and Angel because like those two themes tie into each other. but. Those Chosen by the Planet is his actual theme. You first hear it in Remake when Cloud has his freak out. He starts seeing Nibelheim on fire, and then he's, you know, stumbling, and then he meets Sephiroth. Mm -hmm. That's where we first hear it. So that is, um, that is his theme, and it is all over the place in Remake. Very, very easily the theme that recurs the most in this game. Mm -hmm. um, now, why does it do that? My theory is that it's because... This is kind of a Sephiroth-centric game. Um, he is not the protagonist, but and I hate to use this reference because I'm not a big Marvel Cinematic Universe fan. It's kind of like Infinity War, where Thanos is not the protagonist, but it is a Thanos-centric movie. Mm, I feel like War remake. Story. I feel like remake is kind of very centered on Sephiroth in a lot of ways. Hmm. Yeah. So his okay. theme pops up. His theme pops up even in scenes where it's like more about Genova and stuff, where Genova has her own theme. But we're seeing, and I think that's, I think that's kind of the intention there. But after you meet Sephiroth, the very next theme you hear is uh, some people may have noticed this from Advent Children. Like so, this is right after the first scene, and like, and then you're, and then you're back to walking around Sector Eight. Now, there, this theme is called the Promised Land. Um, it in Advent Children, it plays in two spots. The first time is um, is when Marlene is giving her recap. 
right? You know, she's given her recap and you see like the flashback things and you have this like kind of Buddhist, like um, almost, I guess, choir or whatever you would call it. Um, it's in the original game, it's an acapella theme. Um, and then in this one, it's called the promised land cycle of souls and it's instrumental instead of acapella. Mm. Um, but it's very funny that it plays right here because this is right after we encounter Sephiroth. In Advent Children, the theme plays for the second time right after Cloud defeats Sephiroth. And then, you know, Kadash comes down and then he gets, you know, taken up in the live stream. Um, and it is exclusive to Advent Children. This is the first time we've heard this theme outside of Advent Children. So why would they choose this theme? Why would they not choose literally any other theme? Why would they not just go back to the previous background music that was playing in Sector 8? They don't. They put this here. This is not even the first time they do it, but it is them telegraphing that, at least in my opinion, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, this is telegraphing that this is Advent Children Sephiroth that we just encountered. Like he, it, This may not physically be him, but this is Advent Children Sephiroth influencing what Cloud is seeing, the Sephiroth that Cloud is seeing. Now this is backed up. If you look at On the Way to a Smile, uh, Livestream Black, the, the novella, mm -hmm. Um, he says in there, and I'm going to use the officially released English translation from 2019. He says, so long as Cloud remembers me, I will always exist. And in remake during the scene, he says that which binds us together would be no more. And I would be loath to live in such a world. Like if, if, if Cloud were to die or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Cloud asks him like, oh, you know, you're dead. He says, I am. Like all of this dialogue is referencing that novella on the way to a smile, live stream black. Um, I don't see this as a coincidence. Like, and I know mo I know it's a pretty popular opinion, but I do I have seen some people be like, no, it's not Advent Children Sephiroth. This is Advent Children Sephiroth. Um, and then, you know, the subtitle Cycle of Souls um, is interesting because this could be talking about entering a new cycle of Final Fantasy VII. You know, we're repeating the timeline and then the souls may be referencing the whispers who are, you know, kind of formed from the spirit energy from the live stream. I don't know, but that seems interesting to me that is very interesting um <clears throat> that is okay that's so cool because then you can kind of uh kind of pinpoint which sephiroth you're looking at because it has been confirmed um i'm, I'm pretty sure by the ultimania four. that there there are four sephiroths um in this one <laughs> at, in the one moment right in, in a moment there's there's four sephiroths um so to kind of be able to use the music this is the cycle of souls that you're hearing in the background right now. So oh, prom, it's called the promised land promise cycle, land, of, cycle souls. of souls. Yes. <laughs> Cause um, it is, it is an arrangement of the promised land from the original game. And then they subtitle it cause it's a new version of it. That's interesting. They, which they do, which they do a lot. They, a lot of them, they'll have the original name of the theme and then you'll see like dash something else. Okay. So, so, so they do that a lot. So you're thinking anytime that this this um, this track is playing, this theme is playing, um, anytime this is playing in the background, we're looking at it we're only referencing. Plays once. It only plays once, and it is that it is at that moment. It, it plays, plays. It plays. Once. It plays. Yeah, and it and it plays for a little while because you're walking through the streets of Sector Eight, but it doesn't. You don't ever hear it again. Okay. So, um, but you do hear other. You do hear other callbacks to Advent Children. Um, so if you have other questions about this, we can talk about that, or we can move on to the other another another good instance uh yeah i guess the only thing i would go for <clears throat> kind of keeping on this subject i like it uh so if you're thinking that we're you know you're looking at advent children sephiroth during that moment uh i guess the only other instance where i would feel that you know advent children sephiroth is involved is at the end where where we hear uh, uh -huh. the seven seconds uh till the end theme is there any relation not necessarily with Advent Children, and I do want to talk about that, but if it's okay, I'm going to put a pin in that. Okay. Because right. I do have a whole thing about that, but it is the last thing discussed, or it's the last like one of the last themes we hear, and it it, it just work. It's going to work well if I if I give a little more I'm, context. I'm cool with that. I'm cool yeah, with saving it for the but end. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm so glad you asked about that because <laughs> I do have a lot to say about that. Um, I will okay. say another very, 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 very subtle. Um, theme from Advent Children that plays um, it's a blink and you'll miss it because it's like maybe 30 seconds long mm. is in chapter 17 um, when you're getting in the elevator about to go to what the area called the drum where Genova is housed that big area yeah. Claude gets in the elevator and he, he sees the feather again yeah. But it but we don't hear Sephiroth's late motif here. We hear a theme from Advent Children called Sign. Now this theme in Advent Children played when Cloud has this conversation with Rufus at Healing Lodge, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, he like they call him for a job and he goes up there and then yeah, you know yeah. he he knocks Reno out of the door and locks <laughs> it. and then you know and then he has that conversation with Cloud and you hear the it's a it's a it's only it basically just has piano with a little bit of vocals in it but we hear a little bit of that piano piece in this scene and I remember the first time I heard it, I was like wow they put that in there and I got to thinking about it and I'm like okay well the original theme played during this uh during this conversation what did they discuss they were talking about sephiroth returning in the scene and advent children um but this was also kind of about him returning you know but as we know in advent children he uses genova to return to his full regenerated form and we're about to go we're about to go into the drum where we see genova so it kind of ties in both ways um but it is a theme from advent children that again references sephiroth by the feather floating down why would they use an uh, uh, that theme why would they not use you know you know the the theme that the piano theme that played in chapter one which was called black feather like why would they not just repeat that you know they use this one and i think it's another subtle reference to advent children and and and, and, well i mean it is a reference to advent children but i think it's i think it's trying to talk trying to clue in the game again telegraphing or foreshadowing that Mm -hmm. sephiroth we're seeing here is advent children and like yeah there's four of them but it's very the last one is unknown the one that appears at the edge of creation that it's very clear that one is from like he has to be from advent children and i think that he is that that sephiroth is influencing the ones that you know only cloud can see like in his in his memory or not memories but you know like the ones that nobody else can see that only he's seeing yeah very interesting like that yeah okay Uh, Okay, so we're going to go on to one of my very personal favorite themes in Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's the opening. Um, so I've said this before, that no matter how many times I hear it, man, it's it's goosebumps every time. Um, and especially when that logo strikes the screen. Um, it's just, God, it's so good. Um, frankly, it connects with me on like just a personal level, like an emotional level, uh, more than any theme in any other media. Um, the only thing that comes close and we're going to go back to a star Wars is the star Wars opening scroll, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like that's the only analogy. (laughs) Exactly. So like, it's just, it just, God, it it connects so good. Um, so anyways, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the opening thing. Like if if you have anything, um, anything to say on it's uh, the city of Mako, right? Yes. It's called Midgar city of Mako. Now I will say, um, I'm happy to be able to discuss this because, um, I know you had reached out on Twitter and said, hey, did anybody have anything that they, they want to hear him discuss or analyze? And I, I did have uh, one or two people say they wanted to hear about Midgar City of Mako. And I mm. was thrilled because whew, this is this is like a behemoth of a theme. There is a lot going on in this theme. It is one of the ones I spent the most time on because there's so much going on. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, this is like when you actually click new game when you start up the game you hear the mm-hmm. prelude when you but when you actually start new game you know you have the opening cinematic where it's scrolling through the wasteland and then goes into midgar all that kind of crap this is the theme that's playing there um and probably most people gathered that one of the first things you hear is a choir mm-hmm. singing the lyrics from one winged angel mm-hmm. now this got really really interesting when intergrade came out because if you were really astute, you may have noticed that the lyrics in Intergrade on this theme are different. They actually have it, the choir is not singing the same thing in Intergrade as it is in the in, in the PS4 release. Okay, so look, I've heard I've heard this. Can you um, kind of clarify on that a little bit? What are they singing? Do you okay. know? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in the PS4 release, they are very very definitely singing. One Winged Angel. You're right. The, the original One Winged Angel. There's no doubt about that. Um, and we'll talk about why in a minute here. In Intergrade, I am quite certain, though not 100% positive, that they're singing Advent One Winged Angel because Advent One Winged Angel is the arrangement that plays during the battle in Advent Children with the guitars and, mm-hmm. and the drums and bass and stuff. Um, they rewrote, the, for anybody who doesn't know, they rewrote the lyrics and for, for the Advent Children version. Um, they are not singing the same thing as they are singing in the original game or, you know, they, they did like an orchestral release of the song after, like, I think they called it reunion tracks or something. So it's not, it's not singing the same thing. I haven't one way in angel and you can look this up on like the final fantasy wiki or something. You can actually see both sets of, of lyrics. 
I I spent a lot of time listening to them. It's hard to tell because they are singing in Latin and um, it, it's, you know, when you're singing, the pronunciation just sounds different. So I, I will not swear 100%, but I'm like 90% positive that they are singing Advent One Wing and Angel. If they are, this is a really brilliant use of the theme because this is yet another way of them telegraphing. Hey, this, you guys, you know, when the original game came out, you we knew you guys were going to speculate that this was Advent Children Sephiroth. And now with the, because they knew they were going to do a PS5 port. Like they knew it, like it mm -hmm. came out too late. So I wonder if they even were like, oh, we know that we're going to do, do two versions of this song or, or this theme. And then decided to record both versions. And then that way, when you play it on PS5, it's like, oh, hey, you were, you know, like we're going to kind of give you that nod that, that this is Advent Children Sephiroth. So that's, that's my personal takeaway from it. Interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking it up now. Um, so the extended cut of Advent Children, um, does Advent One Winged Angel, um, and then the lyrics for that one kind of start off with like, do not remain, remain in memory, in memory. Yeah. do not remain, remain in memory. Which uh, ties, it, which ties into the whole kind of what one of the central themes of Advent Children with about, like what you I'll just talked about, yeah. what you just talked about, like it, with the live stream black, um, talking about like, if cloud ever forgets. And he would cease to exist. Yeah. Would Cloud is his. Cloud is literally his tether to existence at this point. Yeah. Like after, like that's what Cloud did to him at the end of the original game. But he's still kicking because Cloud remembers him, and he has found a way to exist through Cloud's memory. It's kind of like it's almost like a toxic relationship. Kind of thing. <laughs> like it's yeah. Like Sephiroth is just can't is, get is rid of one. Him. He's one messed up individual, and he'll do whatever. Get rid to, of him. To, Oh uh, yeah, so like I mean, if we look at the original lyrics, that one of course is "Burning Inside" with violent anger, um, yeah. and so "Burning Inside" with violent anger obviously represents his motives in the first game, and then with yeah. "Advent," do not remain, remain in memory. Yeah, oh. and and I don't think and and like I've seen people be like, oh yeah, burning, you know, burning with rage was supposed to represent Midgar, but I I think that's I I think it's literally they're trying to telegraph like from the very beginning i don't think it has to do with like trying to relate it with midgar as much as like cluing in the gamer that like hey you know in the original game the opening you didn't hear this sephiroth wasn't there but his his vote you know the, the vocal representation of him is intruding as soon as the game starts very much like he very quickly intrudes on the story of final fantasy 7 remake because he he's not in the midgar section of the original game at all but you know then he's here he's popping up all over the place in remake i really believe this they put this in here to telegraph to kind of clue the gamer and through music that sephiroth is going to invade this game like he's going to invade the story in ways that he didn't originally and we're going to show that by immediately with the opening showing how this music which did not appear until the very end of the original game is now appearing at the beginning. Okay. So that's what I think. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to actually uh, kind of turn up the, the music here just to kind of like to go hear it real quick. Yeah. Um, so if you go with, this is the original uh, release of the soundtrack. So this is what played during the PS4 version, the first release. You can hear that. All right. And now I'm going to play the, um, we're going to play the integrate. Uh, so let's get to. Hmm, I don't know. But I might have missed it. It, it, it kind of cycles. Dude, so. that... Here it comes. That is definitely different than what you hear um, in the original, for sure. Yes. Now, it if it was it. if it was Advent, it would and I'm my Latin. I don't I don't do Latin, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, come on, I <laughs> this is gonna be terrible. But it's like nole uh, nole manere, but that's obviously uh, very very different than the um, the Estonos uh, Estons mm. Interes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very. Yeah, so it's totally very different. different syllables there, but uh, it, the, the point <laughs> is, is that yeah, like if you're going to be playing the Advent Children, the Advent One Winged Angel, um, and this is a purposeful 
exactly. change. Yeah. Like there's like no they, way they this put they put time and money into cha- into recording, to, and maybe they did it in the same like recording sessions. But if they went back and did like, why would they do that unless there was something? Uh, unless there was something. Yeah, to know, make a, to make a purposeful change like that, it mm-hmm. it it's it it does. Um, I love what you're saying about like uh, you know like obviously referencing the 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 novella with um, the on way on the way to a smile, uh, where saying like you know can't remain in memory because then I wouldn't exist or if I didn't remain in memory I wouldn't exist. Yeah, and so do um, not remain remain in memory. Yeah, and yeah, and then that's the first thing he's talking about when he when he um, when he you know speaks a cloud. Give me just one second here. Yeah. I'm just just to read the uh, just to read the lyrics. This is very interesting. To be honest with you, uh, this is kind of it's kind of new to me. Like just to kind of like go back and hear that. Oh yeah, the the lyrics are different between the two. Um, and you go to like the original where it's it's more like just talking about do not let me die. Um, and then and then for <laughs> Advent it was like uh it's like come here give me death once more you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he doesn't care it's like oh even if i die i'm not gonna die like and yeah. you know that there's some speculation about that like it, yeah, it's, it's just the end of cypherth and, and amateur and they're now telling us at least in my opinion no like he, he this is Advent children Cypheroth. um and and it's funny because i like to me this symbolizes his return mm-hmm. so several of return to this world now if you look at the subtitle of of the one winged angel arrangement for remake it is called one winged angel rebirth right yeah so i, I mean, would call it rebirth of all th- like they could call it anything yes they yes and like i mean i'm sure uh you know sleep easy has dived into this uh, very, very deep. If you guys ever want to watch a Sleep Easy video, please check them out. Um, but, but yeah, so like to kind of to kind of add that musical thing. I don't know if Sleep Easy kind of if he talked about that or not. Uh, maybe maybe he didn't. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like to kind of throw in that uh, that Advent Children, the Advent One Winged Angel is playing, and the, and like looking up the lyrics, guys. It it's telling you a lot and we're going to be talking about another song uh yeah another song with lyrics in it um and that's hollow that's coming up a little later on in the show but um the lyrics the lyrics though right like mm-hmm. lyrics they put a lot of thought into this stuff, they yeah. are yes yeah they, they really think about the lyrics a lot and i know najima actually writes a lot of the lyrics for this kind of stuff and i know i think i think advent was written by uh was written by nomura but um hollow was written by nojima while Uematsu composed the music for Hollow, so it's, hmm. it's very interesting. But um, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll definitely get into more of that <laughs> later. But I, I've been rambling on this one theme, but we still have more to talk about. Yes, we do. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, I just I just think that's really fascinating. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, it is. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of like time thinking about this. So yeah. To kind of just to kind of if you if you go back, it almost makes me want to kind of go back and listen to them again to hear for more subtle. Um, <laughs> Uh, subtle clues uh so very awesome that's sephiroth's uh theme and now let's go ahead and dive into um oh w- is there any more on the the oh, yeah. city of Monko? oh yeah yeah, yeah oh so. yes absolutely um so we get so we the first part is you know kind of this ominous you know and, and, and it is slowed down like his the, the the choir is singing a lot slower than it does in the actual theme so um you know it creates this eerie atmosphere and then you know the the live stream particles go up and then it goes into space and then we get the proper opening with Aerith. but that doesn't last long but when we when she shows up we we finally hear the actual opening theme which is just called opening um we actually hear that theme play at this moment where she's in the alley and all that kind of stuff and a lot of people have talked a lot about this where you know she gets spooked and leaves the alley and all that kind of stuff and i do think there's a lot to that um now the ultra the material ultimania plus that came out uh, last month um they uh i think it was toriyama in there mentioned that she possessed that Aerith in this game possesses memories that she should not have. Right. So I do have to get into a little bit of theorizing here, which I try not to do a whole lot. But my theory is that, um, is that, uh, because I've always wondered like, okay, she clearly knows things that she's not supposed to know. So how did she get them? And there's something going on with like, somehow she's communicating with like Aerith from the original timeline. And I do think my personal opinion is that she was 
you know, somehow like the memories from OJ Aerith were, were transferred onto her or into her mind. Um, Aerith found a way to communicate. I think personally, Sephiroth instigated all this by like trying to reset the timeline and Aerith kind of followed him because, oh crap, I've got to stop him. So Aerith doesn't seem like the inst- like that she would be the one to instigate something like that. Hmm. Um, and, you know, she definitely doesn't know who the whispers are when she first sees them, right? Like she asked, what are they when, you know, when, Cla- when she, her and Cloud are getting attacked or whatever um and and then the ultimania plus they did say that that their that their objective is to steal her memories they're trying to steal the memories that she now has and i think and i think the reason why they're going after her is because sephiroth at this point wasn't physically in the world he was you know he he was cloud saw him but it was just in cloud's mind Hmm. but but Aerith physically like her physical body got these memories. so i think that's why the whispers show up and go after her first Again, maybe I'm looking too much into it, um, but um, you know, I, I do think it's interesting. We only do see Sephiroth physic, like kind of physically, like actually in the flesh once, and that's at the end of the game. Which, oh yeah, that happened in the original too. Like I thought that was kind of neat. Like the original mm-hmm. game, we don't see him physically until we get to the Northern Crater, because other times it's Genova, like him manipulating Genova to create his own likeness, which is what in here it's either his memory, you know, memories or a vision that Cloud has, or it's you know um the Sephiroth clones or something and we don't see it so I thought that was kind of a cool easter egg like they still maintain that um and then uh, but the opening theme does kick in at that moment and then it goes back into the choir singing um and then the opening pops back in during like the fanfare but the mm-hmm. opening theme we is is very significant and we have a lot more to talk about there which if you want to hop into that I'm good if you have other questions yeah, let's go right into it. Uh, this is uh, the opening theme. That's still part of the city of Mako, right? That's uh, the. So when I say the opening theme, I mean like actual opening from yeah, the we're, original we're gonna, game, like where it goes out of that and then goes into the. Right? Yeah, yeah, the. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, like, you know, if you remember the scene from Advent Children, the very beginning where Red Thirteen is running, they play the opening over it, and it's what plays at the very beginning of the original Final Fantasy VII. Yes. Because like all this other stuff with the choir and stuff is new that stuff. That was all new, right? Yeah, yeah. and very important, uh, it, you know. Um, so, <laughs> man, wow. Okay, so now we're getting into the the opening theme. So, and it's funny because like, why why would they use opening anywhere except for the opening of the game? But they do. Like, why? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and this took me so long to 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 come up with a, even a theory. And I again, I could be dead wrong, but op- the opening theme appears. Um, for a second time in chapter nine, at the very beginning, Clown um, is talking. You know, Aerith pops out and she's talking to Cloud Orb, and, and it's the way the the way the camera is. It's, it looks kind of like the Sleeping Forest scene when she pops out of the tree when Cloud's having the memory, or whatever. Yeah. And then very quickly, like he has a memory or he has one of his little brain zaps. But unlike other scenes, we don't go inside his head and see what he's seeing. All we see is his reaction, and he cries a tear. Mm. presumably he's seeing her death that's that's probably what it is but we don't hear eris theme play here or or anything we hear the opening theme play i was like why the hell did they put that in there the opening is just used to it's it's not even like it's not used to represent a specific thing it's just used to represent the opening Mm -hmm. so then i started thinking okay why does why does it why does it pop up here and then i started listening deeper and found that it actually appears uh, multiple times in chapter 18. So we have, so like now we're jumping towards the end of the game. So we have this theme, um, it's actually called World of Whispers, World, W-H-R-O-R-L, mm-hmm. World of Whispers. So this this plays, and you are going to have a hard time hearing this if you're if you're just watching a scene from the game, because there's the, this is when the whispers are like surrounding the Shinra headquarters. And, um, you know, the, the party has already escaped and they're on the highway and they stop and they look up and then, and then, and then it, you know, goes inside the building and we see how, or, uh, how Rufus is, you know, witnessing the whispers and he's kind of like looking around and songs like, what the hell are you looking at? Um, the opening, this theme starts with the opening theme. Like we hear the opening notes, the, da, 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 you know, da, 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 da. we hear that um, at the very beginning of this. And then it segues into like Shinra's theme when we get, when we go inside the building and we're watching Rufus, which makes sense because, you know, it's Rufus Shinra. Um, and then at the very end, it goes, you know, we go back outside to see the party looking up at the, at the headquarters with the whispers, like 
flying around it. And, you know, Tifa asks what they're doing, and Aerith's like, oh, who knows? But we get the opening at the very beginning and at the very end of this. And I'm like, why would they, again, why would they put the opening theme here? Like, I, I don't get it. And then, and, and it's very, very hard to hear this because you have, like, the whispers flying around, so the wind flapping and, like, you know, Cloud's motorcycle engine is going. So you really have to listen to this theme, like, like on its own mm -hmm. otherwise you're gonna miss a lot of this I, I had to do that to even catch it i was like oh crap there here it is again <laughs> um and i'm now going to get into a theme that a lot of people asked about and i think actually i think it, i think you had even asked about it before which is the theme that plays when you meet sephiroth at yeah. you know, the end of the highway okay so there's a, a also this is a brilliant theme um it is called those chosen by the planet dash destiny comes so this is a this is telegraphed as another arrangement of sephiroth's theme which is those chosen by the planet right mm -hmm. um now it is based on very largely around his theme but it also contains elements of Genova's theme um towards the beginning um it, it kind of starts with his theme goes into Genova's. we have a very nice like percussive rhythm underneath it which is kind of like a a tie between the two so that it easily segues like they put this new like rhythmic part in there so that it segues very nicely from Sephiroth's theme to Genova's. It's so good. I love this theme so much. Um, and it's all very subtle. So it's kind of like, if you're not really paying attention to it, you're going to be like, oh yeah, it's familiar, but you're not really going to kind of catch what's going on. I played it a little too loud. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Or I guess I'm on it. Yeah, 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 not your fault. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, now my dog, now my dog's going. Um, <laughs> But um, so it does start out with Sephiroth's theme, goes into the other theme, and um, and then you know he's you know this is this is when Sephiroth is you know kind of taunting Cloud and Aerith tells him you know you're wrong and you know like he says he would he would protect the planet, um, but he you know but he only cares about himself or whatever. Give me just one second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, playing it right now. Here's the. This is the those chosen by the planet. Destiny comes. It plays on the bridge as Steven was saying this is one of the ones that I was most uh, curious about mm -hmm. there's so much going on That, see that part right there i don't know are you are you back oh yeah i'm back okay Sorry. yeah i love this part um uh at, at one minute and so he's here goes ready oh you can't hear it i can't hear it. Dun, 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 dun. you know yeah and it's like what is what is that you know so they do, yeah, they do, they do put like original elements into the theme. Um, mm -hmm. This is, this is most notable, which is actually something that I'm bummed about. It's most notable when they switch to, because this scene actually is like where you first see Zach. Mm -hmm. And he's like standing, he's like, oh yeah, I guess the price of freedom is steep. And, you know, <laughs> then he charges the guys. Um, I really, really, really hoped that they would... Uh, kick in with some crisis core music here oh yeah they don't i love crisis core's music and they do not have it anywhere in this game and i really hope this is something they rectify in part two but um even in the uh even in the intermission like special scene like they're playing the main theme when he's at the church they aren't playing anything specific to him um so we do have like his original part, which is which is cool, but it, it does seem to be just original like new music. It's, it, unless I'm unless I'm forgetting something and it's actually like the main theme or something. I thought I, I do not remember them playing the main theme there. I think it was original. Um, I don't have it right in front of me though. Um, uh, so they play that theme, and then after we go back, we kind of have. Um, we have you know some final words where Sephiroth you know you know slashes into the the portal and he says I'm waiting Cloud and he walks in, and then Eris does her whole thing where she you know changes the portal into light. I still don't know what that's about. Like I would love to hear theories on that because mm -hmm. um, they never, I, as far as I'm aware, they never put that in one of the Ultimania. Is like why does she change the portal? Like 
I don't know. But, you know, when she lifts her hand and the light comes out and the, the portal goes from dark to like bright, mm -hmm. um, that switches to air slate motif. So it goes from what we were hearing, then now we're hearing air slate motif. Um, and which makes sense because the scene has now shifted to focus more on Aerith than Sephiroth because Sephiroth has exited the scene. Mm -hmm. um, nothing too, nothing too, you know, groundbreaking there. But then, and I don't know if I, I can't hear the music, so I don't know if you've gotten to this point yet. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I just went to where she turns it to uh, white. Yeah, uh, so light. you will, so you will hear after this that we're going to go back into the opening scene. Hmm. Hold on. It's going to be around when she talks about the um, boundless, like, terrifying freedom line that mm. she says. Yeah, you can hear the da na 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 going on. Yeah. So it's very curious that this comes in where it does. Um, she starts talking about, you know, they ask her, like, what, what's beyond there? And she says, oh, you know, freedom, boundless, terrifying freedom, I think is what she says. Um, and then it does grow, and then, you know, then the music does start, you know, getting more intense, and then we go back into Sephiroth's light motif, and then it kind of starts going back and forth between Sephiroth's theme and the opening theme. Um, it's really, it, it's really cool. Um, so now we're going to kind of get into my interpretation of why they keep playing opening. Um, again, in the original game, it just represented literally just, hey, this is the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but... Now we have it first playing in Midgar City of Mako when we first see Aerith. Now at first glance, it's like, oh, it's just playing because this is the original opening of the, you know, the opening of the original game. So they're putting the music to go with it. But I think it might actually be, um, it might actually be more you know, significant than that. Because like I said, I think, you know, original Aerith is somehow communicating with the remake Aerith. Like mm -hmm. she's transferring memories. Somehow remake Aerith gets the memories. We know that. Like, and so it has to have come from the original Aerith. And I think like that moment where like she is like, you know, she opens her eyes may have been like, it's supposed to be the literal moment where she gets these memories. And that's mm -hmm. why the opening theme is playing. And then we hear it again in chapter nine where like he's having a memory of a future that we later learn might not be set in stone anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we hear it with the, you know, like I said, with the roll of whispers where they're circling. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what they're actually, like what they're trying to do while they're circling the headquarters, but it does tie into the whispers themselves who are trying to preserve the original timeline. And then it plays again when she talks about like, hey, we're forging a new path where, you know, boundless, terrifying freedom. So to me, it seems like they've repurposed the opening theme to kind of represent like a new beginning. Mm -hmm. So it is still about an opening, but it's about a new opening. Now, I could be wrong. Um, I could I could be dead wrong, but um, this is what that's that's what I've come up with. But they're they're putting it here for a reason. Yeah, uh, and like it, it, in this particular moment, uh, it, it's you know trying to remake. Obviously, it's been hinted at before, uh, whereas I think Nomura was like. Hey, uh, for the for the you know the subtitle remake, you're gonna have to just stay tuned. Um, so w we kind of already have been on this path that okay, this is not a remake. This is a remake of the story or something like we're going like Sephiroth or Aerith. Yeah, like he's he's remaking the timeline. Remaking like, the time. So yeah, it's not about remake. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's not a remake of the original game. It's like it's like um it's kind of like a meta. Exactly, and so like to have this uh this idea to have the the opening play um and like you said why would you play the opening anywhere other than yeah. the opening um yeah. and that's because like does it play um for this particular moment yes um but does it play when it does play is it at any moment where the where the the story is trying to be remade is it at any moment where like um yeah. like in this particular moment on the bridge um this is a moment where Aerith is literally saying let's go remake you know let's go remake the timeline let's go let's let's do this i was held yeah. back for a while let's go do it and then as soon as he does it the opening kind of the opening kind of finds its way in it sneaks its way in and then it starts to kind of fight like like kind of with, yes, fight with exactly. like a sephiroth type thing yeah, it's like going exactly. back and forth with sephiroth <laughs> um interesting whether or not that means like sephiroth is kind of <laughs> intertwining with it or if it means that like Sephiroth is, are they at bat? Like at odds? Yeah, with each I, other? I would. Yeah, I would almost. I would. 
I would almost think that like that could be to represent that they're fighting for like they're fighting for different outcomes. Like it's gonna mm. they both are for, trying to forge a new future, but but Sephiroth wants ending A and and or I guess like ending A was the original. He wants, <laughs> yeah. he wants ending B and and you know Aerith. He wants his plan A to actually work this time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he, he's looking for like his plan, whatever the hell he's trying to right. do at this point. He's looking for that, and then Aerith is looking, and it could be like a clashing of the future that they're both trying to forge. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then again, you do have it also in reference to the Whispers, which could be like the Whispers trying to maintain the original. Ending yes. to, to to not I, I don't know. yeah like, like yeah to d try not to like you know obviously we can dive into theories if you want to uh, <laughs> but we can keep this uh, a music analysis but uh, yeah to kind of like go into a little bit where you could think that maybe the like the whispers are just kind of the defense of the planet like the planet yeah. is trying to defend it and as soon Absolutely. as Aerith and I, I mean I am kind of uh, I know you kind of touched on it a little bit you're like I don't think Aerith would do that like to take the initiative. But I kind of feel like maybe Aerith is the one trying to remake Could it. Could be. Could um, be. Whereas, like, maybe she... And then Sephiroth just says, oh, wow, okay, so you can do that. Let me follow. Yeah. And she knew that she he was going to follow. Uh, is this just where my mindset is? Sure. And then, like, so she she goes back and um, kind of, like, does that, plants plants the memories, in, and let's, let's kind of get it started. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so, like... And then once again, that's the opening. The opening kind of plays, and then the opening plays again, like you said, with Aerith uh, in that, in the uh, in that alleyway, um, right? Yeah, it plays with her. That yeah, yeah. That's the first time we hear it, and mm. then well, and then we hear it over like when the title comes up. But that's I think yes. really is just more of like fanfare. Hey, like, here's the opening. Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I mean, yeah, you know, you have to kind of because that's where because like and, and all the other places we're just hearing like kind of the opening like the first few like i guess measures for it um and then that's the part where like it kind of crescendos and it's like you know -da 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 -da. Yeah. Uh, so i think that part is literally just like it's a fanfare but so and, and all the other parts it it only plays like the opening part um yeah so to, to have that part. opening part again play after cloud like kind of has that vision or, or whatever he, he has a tear yeah. coming, and then it's yeah. just like hey we're going to try to remake. We're going to try to do, you know, like just, you know. And I think that was foreshadowing. Like, yeah, I think that was totally the music, like the music and the and the scene all, all together foreshadowing. I mean, everybody who's played the original game knew what he was, you know, knew what, knew what he was saying. Yeah. Because he was already having, you know, in chapter eight, he, um, you know, he had, you know, she mentioned her material and then he had a glimpse of like the material falling off the altar. So like, mm -hmm. he's already seeing glimpses of her death. So yeah. I think there, he, I think that was the moment where he, he saw the sword go through. But they didn't want to. Sh but that's also why you don't. That's why you don't go into his mind because Square doesn't want to want to reveal that for like first time players. Yeah. And and they and they do that again when uh, you know when they're fighting the whispers. You know they kind of they they have the scenes from Advent Children. You know they show him lowering her into the water, but they like really Quickly. like overexposed it so that you couldn't see who he was actually. Yeah, talking. yeah. Uh, yeah. That's very interesting stuff about the opening to be honest um to like it's very it's it's, it's, it's the most interesting theme to discuss in my opinion uh, with remake because it's the most ambiguous yeah i mean this is the opening and why would it keep playing back uh during the during the game and just like like we were talking about this this being the particular moment that is the, the big standout here on the bridge um where where Aerith basically proclaims like listen let's go we're gonna we're, we're gonna do it we're gonna change we're gonna change the course um and even even red says it like the defy destiny and stuff like that so it's yeah. time to to remake things apparently um so yeah uh that's interesting as far as the music goes and i always i'm always of the mind that nothing is coincidence like nothing is like well i would like to say nothing is fanfare right uh, right. that's, that's where I'm at. So nothing is just like, oh, let's throw that in there as a little subtle nod. Nah, it's like that has meaning <laughs> that has purpose, uh, for it to be there. And especially mm -hmm. with, with this game, I mean, obviously yeah. everything's so well thought out. So that's, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so we get on to the seven seconds till the end or do we'll, you we'll pull that? We'll pull that pen out. Uh, yeah, let's we'll pull talk that about pen it. out. Let's go. Yeah. With it. yeah. Cause yeah, here we are the seven seconds to the end, which follows that battle um after the bridge part um and i think it's the most like 
enigmatic <laughs> themes of all in all of the uh, Final Fantasy VII remake, besides what we just talked about. Obviously, now that one has my my mind going a hundred miles. Oh uh, yeah, I know, right? Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> this has been my brain for like the last two months. I'm like, oh my god, like, <laughs> what does this mean? It, it's honestly, what does this mean? it's honestly one of my favorite tracks. Like besides the actual opening of the game, like that track we just discussed is one of my favorites, uh, just because it intertwines like the darkness of Sephiroth and then the, the uplifting the hopeful, of yeah, the hopefulness yeah. and yeah. God, I love it's it. So, it's so good. And it's, it's, it acts as kind of a medley of several like scenes from the game. It's, it's really good. Yeah. Like, I, like I, people kept asking me about it. So I listened to it deeper and deeper and I'm like, the more I listen to it, I'm like, man, like there's a, <laughs> there's a lot. This is, was a really well done thing. Yeah. Um, so seven seconds to the end plays at a very uh, mysterious part of the game. Anyway, this is, I mean, this, the edge of creation like this is all totally new at this point in the game yeah. everything is just like what is happening um so sephiroth kind of leans in and whispers seven seconds till the end um mm. what will you do with it uh so do you have any thoughts on the theme that's playing during this uh the edge of creations um sequence yes absolutely you can't like you have to talk about this one right um, right so i would say going back to midgar city mako i think it's really impressive how like they had the opening with like sephiroth choir and then the opening theme which we later find out is significant in other ways and this all was like the very opening theme is telling us so much about like what's going to happen in the game just through music so when i'm listening to seven seconds till the end i'm thinking this is not arbitrary like they're either very coincidentally, coincidentally, we're just like, oh, we have to have music and we want to use something for the original game to throw it here. But this is too significant of, of a theme for me to think that it's not them also like telegraphing something or foreshadowing something. So anybody who is not aware, Seven Seconds Till the End is an arrangement of uh, Listen to the Cries of the Planet. This mm -hmm. theme plays in the Forgotten City. And I'm pretty sure that's the only place it plays in the original game. If not, it's still... It's still the that's the main function of it. It plays there, and what happens in the Forgotten City? Aerith dies. You know, now they could play Aerith's theme there, and like yeah, you know, but it did, wouldn't really fit the scene, and it might be too on the notes. So, I heard a theory that I really hated when I first heard it, and I've kind of come around to it because based off of like listening to the music and trying to think why the hell would they put put this theme here? And it's and again we're looking at the title of the theme. The theme is called Seven Seconds Till the End. Mm -hmm. So it's re it's pointing the it's pointing you to that specific line, not the you know they could have called it Edge of Creation because that's like where it takes place or, or anything else, but they called it Seven Seconds Till the End. So I think that's the crux, like that's that's where the theme is, that's what the theme is hinging on is that particular idea. And the only thing that I can come up with is that this is supposed to be referencing Aerith's death. Now somebody had made this really weird, wild observation that that the, the, it takes several seven seconds to, to drop down and kill her, and I, at first I was like that has to be coincidence. Mm. And I hated that idea at first, but I think that might be what we're talking about here. Now, again, this is just, we're getting, we're getting into, into like heavy, like speculation. So yeah. I could be wrong. Um, and I'm not going to like die on this hill or anything, but <laughs> that's, I, you know, when I'm trying to analyze the music, like what else, what else could you come up with? Like this theme is really closely associated with her death and it's not really like, other than just being a theme for like an area, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it, that's the only other impact or significance it has like um and why would they play it here and what what else you know what is he talking about i mean he could be talking about any number of things so i don't want to like get too in the weeds with it because it's so esoteric but like to me without any other information i have to say i think he is talking about this moment now you know it, it so it, it does it, it kind of simultaneously calls back to the original game and foreshadows an event that will probably be in part two or part three hmm. um and you know we've already we've already talked you know Toriyama commented on this on the on the Ulti, the Ultimania Plus and he said hold on he said um, I think I wrote down this quote somewhere yeah he said he said that time had like at the edge of creation time had stopped in Cloud's mind and that's why it resembles like his his you know the the visuals are similar to the end of the original game and then he said when it resumes the world will quote meet its doom within seven seconds or with some kind of power, the path of space and time can be changed. Mm -hmm. My personal prediction, and I very well could be wrong, is that Cloud is going to stop Sephiroth from doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that if he, but what he's saying, what Toriyama's words mean here is that if he allows Aerith to die, 
the events of the original game repeat the world ends with meteor fall it doesn't really end but you know what i mean um and then also kind of in a sense clouds world in because he, like he loses such a huge piece of himself or he saves her and now we've reached like the actual point of no return where space and time have been irreversibly changed and everything changes and maybe it's not a good change maybe like i do wonder like will they spare her there but then have her decide that she has to sacrifice herself later because like oh things are getting too messed up you know, and then you get into the whole like, oh, well, what's going on with Zach? Like, there's going to be a time like convergence where Zach like meets up with them. And maybe that happens because like, because like when he, you know, Cloud somehow saves Aerith here, like maybe it causes like a big convergence and then like Zach pops out and he's like, Aerith, you know, yeah. I don't know. Like, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot. I mean, and like I said, this is just like personal like prediction stuff. I'm not going to like swear on this, but yeah. Like, I, I don't know what else, why else would they play this thing here? Like, so it's interesting that you, you draw the comparison, uh, to the sleeping forest, right? Um, yeah. is that what you're saying? Is that what, is that well, the, doo -doo 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 is that so like, this this actually plays in the forgot like when you're going the forgotten the i'm this sorry is the, this yeah. is the da -na 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 yes yeah, yeah 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 okay i got you i got you so it's kind of playing off of that and that's what like having that kind of draws the comparison to yeah this is about Aerith's death um but for me i've always kind of been of the mindset that it's not like i i, I mean know it's be. kind <laughs> of right i mean and, and like you you might be very on track with everything but that for so like for me it's just kind of feels like this is um i feel like this is going to be the end of the game like i don't know for me yeah. i feels like it, i feel like this is the end of the game like f you can you have seven seconds to stop sure. uh everything and then like eventually the final moments of the game will revisit this moment and yeah. uh revisit the scene i guess and we'll know what it means now at that point and then yeah. you have basically solved everything. You won't need an Advent Children. There won't be, like, because Geo Sigma doesn't exist. There won't be yeah. a uh, Dirge of Cerberus or anything like that. So I feel like everything's going to end. Like, everything's going to have a, a more satisfying ending, if that's a thing for people. Um, a more satisfying yeah. ending uh, for them. And you will, there will be no such thing as a Geo Stigma or a. Sure. Or, or a like underground the deep ground won't the deep ground won't be there anymore like we're gonna solve yeah. everything and remake um is where where i'm at uh yeah so i am all set for the ending to be completely different like i am my mindset yeah. is there will be no Absolutely. meteor fall there no no Absolutely. no live stream coming up yeah. um so i feel like this moment was kind of like we'll come back to this We'll come back to this. This is going to be a looming question on everybody's mind. What does the seven seconds mean? Yeah. And we'll revisit it in part three or four. Yeah. So, it, and I do think like, because I do like, it, if this is talking about that specific moment where like, you know, where Aerith dies in the original, it could be like that they play the music there and then like it goes into Cloud's mind and then like he flashes back to this scene, the edge of creation scene. And then he's like, oh, you know, it has this moment and he yeah. regains control of himself and stuff. So, I mean, but yeah, you, you could be right. It, it also could just be an Easter egg because that's one of the like final themes that you hear in disc one. And this is the end of part one. Yeah, maybe they're, maybe it's just cheeky. <laughs> like they might just be doing something cheeky. I, I, I really don't like, but yeah, like I said, yeah, I'm not like married. Said. I'm not. I'm not married to this uh, interpretation. It's just you know, everybody wants to hear people theorizing about about part. Oh two yeah. Now. So absolutely. like this is yeah. like here you go. This is this is my <laughs> this is my theory. Um, I, I yeah. I, and to me, I just like, are they really gonna like tease us just to have it play out the same way? Eh, like i don't know like like i don't like like a lot of people think they're just gonna pull the rug out from other uh, under us and just kill her again but i don't feel like that'd be shocking enough and i don't know i do feel like they kind of wrote themselves into a corner because for me there's no outcome that's going to surprise me at this point because they just like I, i'm expecting her to die or live or whatever <laughs> you know i'm expecting zach to show up or not like <laughs> i'm just i mean i don't know what's going to happen so i'm expecting everything I, right. I, I i will say i'm personally not a huge fan of this scene just because i feel like they don't tell us enough yeah to this really is, this is definitely it, it's something. too esoteric to yeah. really like bother speculating too heavily on like i did it just because like we have to talk about it, but mm -hmm. getting down to it, if I'm having a casual conversation, I'm going to say, I really don't have much of an opinion because they just did not give us anything to go on with this scene, but 
Yeah, I mean, so the music is the only thing we have to go on, and so judging just by what information we have, that's the best I can come up with. This, this is this is telegraphing like that that moment, yeah. and whether she will live or die, and and that's what everybody's thinking about. That's exactly what they want us to think about. Is oh, the big question is Aerith now going to live or die? That's what everybody. That's the question everybody's asking. So that's why I feel like maybe this music was chosen to kind of like draw our attention to that scene, but I'm not really like sure what direction they go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I mean, if this is this is also, uh, if you want to kind of tie it instead of tying it to uh, Aerith, um, and and you know, obviously, the Forgotten City is is a very important place where Aerith, the moment happens. Um, but if you want to kind of tie it to the actual location, um, this is the, um, I mean, this is the, the the capital of the ancients, right? The city of the yeah. like, this is their the lost city of the ancients, right? Yeah. Um. So if you kind of want to tie it back to Cetra, I mean, you could, right? Like. It's, yeah, Sephiroth, yeah, because Sephiroth thought he was a Cetra until at least until he you know got thrown into the live stream. So. Yeah, I mean, like, in in the Could funny be. thing is, is like that moment right here. Listen, I'm gonna play it. And then like, and then it kind of fades away, and then like you actually. I guess, I guess it's actually pretty consistent throughout the whole song. Yeah, I was going to say, I yeah. actually did I actually, I actually did a rendition of this on piano. Um, so, the, oh, yeah, it, it, it plays throughout until you get to the moment where they start sort of, like, to where they have their big fight. About and then our, it goes, yeah. in, and then you have this big orchestral swell, and that's where it turns into a completely different thing. But, right. then, yeah. but then at the end, it does go back. It, it ends with kind of that, um, that a little bit. So Yeah, it makes me wonder, so, like, if... if if you want to draw, I would draw the connection to the city of ancients in a way. Like sure. maybe this is the this is the theme for that location. Yeah. Um, it so, is. Yeah, definitely. So I would go. I would almost want to go like say this is has something to do with Cetra or Cetran. Sure. Or uh, maybe the edge yeah. of creation is kind of a Cetran location. Could be. Absolutely. Um, so maybe maybe that's where I'm kind of going with it. Uh, absolutely but that's that's very interesting that you kind of point that out that it is yeah. the it's that it's that da, na, 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 that plays absolutely. during the forgotten yeah and, and if you listen and it, yeah and if you listen to the original theme that like that that rhythm is going pretty much the whole time like absolutely. um and, and yeah and like that theme is not playing during Aerith's death like the music cuts out and then it goes into Aerith's thing so yeah maybe it's just maybe it is a reference to etc and like maybe trying to tie it into sephiroth in some way because he thinks he's the uh he thinks he's entitled to the planet mm -hmm. you know right. i mean could be could be that like i mean absolutely 100 percent. it is like i said when you if you really want to get real with it it's too esoteric to really pin down something specific so i definitely agree at this point it's anybody's game to like anybody's yeah, exactly. guess yeah. just anybody's guess as to what the heck they're doing so yeah so um very interesting there um Man, this is this has been a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining yeah, me, uh, Stephen, here for this one. Do you do you want to kind of dive into a little bit more, like uh, some quick Easter egg uh, type? Yeah, that's that's something. Yeah, if you want to do that, we can definitely. We can definitely yeah, let's, I, let's, have, I have other themes to talk about. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Like th so, let's throw in some. Um, let's throw in some fun uh, or or interesting um, kind of Easter eggs that you wanted to kind of throw out there sure. while we're talking. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we're going to kind of go through this just like chronologically through like chapter by chapter. Um, so like the first one would be like in chapter three, we um, we immediately hear the main theme of Final Fantasy VII, which is a beautiful, beautiful piece of music. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the original game, you had various arrangements of this playing, uh, mostly during travel segments. Um, like when you first enter the world map after you leave Midgar, you're hearing the main theme. And like when you go and, you know, when, when, you know, the final like high, you know, uh, like after you've done everything except the Northern Crater, when you're in the high wind, you're flying around, there's a theme called the high wind takes to the skies, which is heavily built upon the main theme. It's, it's, it's just like another arrangement of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do think that like, maybe they were trying to put that in as an Easter egg. Like they put it in sector seven, like that's where you first hear it in, um, in remake is, is in, is in sector seven in chapter three. And I wonder if maybe they did that because like, that's the first area where you can kind of travel. Like it's the first, you know, kind of mm. non-linear open area. Um, like I said, not, not like, groundbreaking but, right right you know it's the uh, all the rest of the stuff is just going to be like kind we're of on easter, easter egg stuff yeah, now, we're, yeah. We're, on, we're on we're on lighter <laughs> stuff so if you're just tuning in uh please be sure to watch this back on uh the yeah. youtube uh the youtube vod um it's going to be youtube.com slash final fan tv uh we dive into a bunch of uh 
deeper stuff like Barrett Shinra connections, uh, the Advent Children connection, seven seconds till the end, that scene on the bridge, which was insane. Um, I'm really excited to to kind of go back and listen to it some more because there's a lot of yeah. subtle cues in there. Yeah, um, so absolutely. right now we're just on some Easter eggs and some fun uh, little little finds. Um, yeah. But go ahead, go on. Yeah. So there were two uh, there are two themes that play um, like right when cloud wakes up when he hears marco in the next apartment and yeah. then and then right after like the door opens or whatever um there's actually there are two different themes but they're both arrangements of trail of blood which is a theme that plays when they see the trail of blood in, in the shinra headquarters um so these are genova centric themes um which i think is, yeah they're uh, the themes in the remake are called noises in the night and mako poisoning and mako poisoning in particular is like i think it's just referencing that you know Marco is suffering from Marco poisoning, but they do, you know, they do kind of foreshadow like the events that like this, this is connected to Genova before new players might necessarily understand who Marco is. Obviously, like it's, that's one of those things where it's kind of lost on veteran players because we're just so like, oh yeah, we know who this is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's one of the, he's one of the clones. Um, <laughs> Um, actually, one of my favorite ones is, um, and this will go back to your Final Fantasy X um, uh, kick that I've been on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit on fun. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, you know, when you're when you go into the shop, you can buy you know you can buy the jukebox thing, jukebox uh, themes, and the prelude um, is is the first one that you can buy. Yeah. Now, if you listen to it, this arrangement is very very similar to Final Fantasy X's arrangement of prelude. Like, go back and listen to both of them; they sound pretty similar. <laughs> It's got kind of like it's got kind that, of that feel too. It's, yeah, and and you know, for people who aren't aware, they have basically confirmed that Final Fantasy X is like a very distant prequel to to so like these two universes are connected. Here we Final go. Fantasy X, yeah, playing it right now for the for the viewers and listeners. The prelude of uh, Jukebox on Final Fantasy. Oh yeah, dude, that does. Mm -hmm. That does have. <laughs> And, I mean, and, it's fun. Yeah, it's obviously. Yeah. And, and I think this, I, I honestly think this was, may have been intentional because we do have the other Easter egg with Final Fantasy X in the Shinra building where you, if you see the photograph, there's a guy wearing the Shinra mask from X2. Mm -hmm. yep, so Shinra. I think this may have been like another very subtle nod. It may just be coincidence. But like I said, there's not that much coincidence in this game from what we've seen. So. There we go. I'm, I'm, that's the Final Fantasy X. Yeah. Yeah. The fight, it, it definitely has that upbeat, like, yeah, and it kind of has the, 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 you know, trilling, doo -doo 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 -doo, like going a little bit quicker than what it does in the, uh, in the Final Fantasy VII version. So, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then we have like uh, another one that plays in chapter three is a thing called On Our Way. This also plays at the, uh, in the post credit scene of intermission when they're walking to. Um, this is a, uh, this is just like a general town theme. It plays in Calm and Junum. Um, and this plays after they rescue Johnny in chapter three. So um, it just seemed like they wanted a new piece of music and, and kind of put that there. Now I'm going to talk about two real quick here that I really don't understand. Okay. Um, there's one called Lurking in the Darkness, Suspicious Man, which is an arrangement of Lurking in the Darkness. Um, this is played when Cloud um, go, leaves uh, Seventh Heaven after he's told he's not going to be on the Mock Reactor 5 job. And then he sees Corneo's lackeys and they're like, hey, we're looking for a guy with a gun arm. And then, you know, they lead him to the doom rat area and um and this theme in the original game just played like in underground areas it first played when they're in the tunnels going from Mako reactor 5 no idea why they played this theme here like i, I maybe because like corneo's lackeys are kind of metaphorically looking in the dark i don't know hmm. um so there are a couple of themes here that do seem to be coincidental so maybe if you want to try to point to this and say all of my theories are crap <laughs> there you go um <laughs> one that was a little bit even more esoteric and i'm gonna give a really 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 like big brain theory here but okay so at the very end of chapter three um jesse is proposing that cloud join her on this mission to steal the blasting agent you know from sector seven mm -hmm. and there's a theme that's called just another job that plays here and this is an arrangement of a theme called on that day five years ago from the original game mm -hmm. 
And this theme in the original game is most famously, it actually plays, um, it actually first plays when they're on the train going from Sector 8 to Sector 7, but it's most famously used in uh, the, the Nibelheim flashback in Calm. So why did they play this here? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give a really, really, really big stretch theory, but this is the best that I came up with. Um, so I mentioned N.J. Gallagher at the beginning of this, mm-hmm. of this episode. He pointed out in his Easter egg video that Cloud does suffer from PTSD, and he mentioned in one of his videos that fire would you know, probably be a big trigger for him because of the Nibelheim fire. And he even went so far as making a connection at how like you get the fire materia first instead of like lightning rise in the, in the original game. And the first summon you get, which is in this scene, is the Ifrit summon, which mm-hmm. is connected to fire. And so he was like, maybe they're kind of cheekily like making, you know, like kind of alluding to clouds, you know, very, you know, acrimonious relationship with fire. So this is also a theme that plays during the Nibelheim flashback which ends with a fire. So maybe there, maybe MJ is, is totally on like hit this one, hit this nail on the head. And <laughs> that's why I think that's, you know, maybe, like I said, maybe I'm, I'm stretching into it. That's literally the, oh, I've thought about it for a while. And I'm like, this is literally the only thing I can come up with for this one. Hmm. That it plays, but, uh, that it plays at this particular moment when you go into it with, uh, with Jesse, yeah, where, where Jesse's yeah, mission. Yeah, where, yeah, where you, when she hands you the Ephraim material as like an advanced payment or whatever. Like maybe mm. it's just supposed to be another reference to Nibelheim if the whole fire thing is true, where like the Ephraim summon and the fire summon are supposed to like kind of, you know, symbolically huh. represent. Maybe, I don't know. Like like I said, that's 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 a, a kind of maybe a big stretch theory, but um, it was the only thing I could come up with. And like, I really do respect MJ for like his incredible knowledge. So I- yeah. Agreed. I was like, hey, I'll give him a shout out here. Like, yes. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah. And other than that, there's, you know, in chapter eight, you have like a, a, an arrangement of Under the Rotting Pizza, which plays in the Sector 5. Like, you know, when you're getting to the slums, that played in the original game, the Sector 5 slums and stuff. So um, I guess the only other things that I'll like really spend time on, um, there was, I just want to call out that in chapter 12, um, there is a specific thing for Aerith and Marlene called Aerith and Marlene, a familiar flower, which is mostly based off of Aerith's theme. Um, I just think it's cool that these two characters have like a unique theme now. Mm-hmm. I love that these two characters had a relationship in the original game and that they're leaning into it. And then um, also in chapter 12, we have a theme that plays when Jesse dies called the look on her face. And I was like, I wonder if this connects to Jesse's theme. Like when I heard it, I was like, that would be really clever because Jesse has her own theme in this game, mm-hmm. which plays in uh, in chapter four when you're on the top plate, like like when you're going to her parents' house. And I actually listened to both like back to back and it does, like they actually put her, her leitmotif into this theme, which I thought was kind of cool. But um, like I said, this is just, you know, Easter egg stuff. And then they played uh, during the chapter 16 scene um, when Cloud meets the Shinra soldier and he's like, I'm going to go get Kunsul. You remember that scene? Yeah, yeah. Um, they played uh, an arrangement of, of, of a theme called Who Are You, which um, was a very, uh, which was a scene that basically only played during scenes about Sephiroth or Genova. And as we know, you know, they were experimented on with Genova cells, uh, uh, Zach and Cloud were. So I think that's maybe why they just kind of play that there is to kind of hint at their past that they had Genova cells. And then this guy's like, hey, I'm gonna get Kunsul, who we know like is associated with Zack. So. Yeah. All um, right. Interesting, yeah. interesting finds there. <laughs> interesting finds. Yeah, yeah, those are just a little, like I said, not not really groundbreaking, but a little yeah. bit uh, a little bit more. Um just yeah. All right. Now here's the here's the one, man. Here's here's the one. Uh, I'm kinda <laughs> curious if you're you're you know that don't don't feel like you know you that you can't you can't talk about it uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i would be lost drifting along floating up high time after time <laughs> and there you'd be shining brightly your smiling face to guide the way all right now who this is the song hollow uh it is the sole comp uh the sole composition of uh umatsu's um uh, for this game yes so this is a, a very very important song as it does play at the at the end of the game. Yeah. Um, it also kind of plays, and, and I feel like this is kind of gives it away. It also it also plays during uh, Sector f- uh, Five, right? Mm-hmm. After, yeah, it's it very first appears after Aerith goes into the um, goes into the orphanage, and it's funny because like that's the first moment after he meets her that she leaves him alone. 
and then and then and then it plays as the background music for the rest of the for the rest of the sector five section until you uh, until you get to the root battle. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. so sounds like we're of same mind here. Yeah. Uh, so, do you uh, do you feel that this song, the song Hollow, is uh, from Cloud's perspective, talking about Aerith? Is that where we're they, they confer- Yeah, they confirmed it was from Cloud's point of view. They did say this is this was written from the point of view of Cloud. So this they is did the Ultimania it. translation. Um, I think it was in the Ultimania, but I, I I know in some interview or another they did say that they wrote this from Cloud's point of view. Now they did not say who because you know they reference a you in the song. So mm-hmm. yes, my interpretation. I have like I have two interpretations. One is probably what it is, and the other one is like again a really 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 big stress theory, but. Um, the first one is that Claude is addressing Aerith. Now, this is backed up by the fact that um, an instrumental version of the song plays during um, during Sector Five. And I honestly, I love this. I love this song. I feel like it's so funny. I get nostalgia feelings when I hear it. Like when I hear themes from the original game, even though it's a new theme, it just fits in so well. Especially is that Umimatsu, baby. Yeah, <laughs> he's he a, he a god among composers. That's all you need I to really do. And, and like no, like not to dis uh, Yoshi or anything, but I do like the instrumental version a little bit better but it's like they're both so good and i mean they're they're the same thing hollow is the song and then hollow skies i think is what they call the yeah hollow skies yeah yeah and it was actually called hollow was actually called empty sky was the original japanese title i don't Mm. know why it was changed but um but the lyrics are kind of vaguely romantic um you know people talk you know he talks there's kind of lyrics that you know like allude to the the generic you being kind of a pillar of strength of sorts which is very common in like you know modern you know romantic pop songs and stuff um but you know if this is from Claude's point of view it's obviously with the knowledge that she is going to die or she that she died because right. there are lyrics towards the end that very much i mean there's one that says i know that you're long gone but i but i will go on how, howling and hollow those are the last those, that, are, like, those the last. are the last ones yeah um i mean even, <laughs> it even says in yeah. here had i had i realized had i thought it yeah. through which and and in the and it's funny. I actually found a translation of the original Japanese before because they had two guys come in and translate it to English. So because like with music, you know, they have to make it rhyme and all you know flow well. So they have to retranslate um, because it was written in Japanese, but they wanted it in English. So, um, but the original Japanese lyrics are even I think more overt. And like in the Japanese, that line was actually, "I understand you are no longer here, but I'll continue crying, screaming, or crying or screaming because I am empty or." hollow um and so like but he's also had visions of her death at this point in the game so that's not like you know it's not like super atypical that he would be that this would be from his point of view with the idea that she's that she's dead or going to die Mm -hmm. um you know um and and then there are are lyrics that talk about him like you know her picking him up always being there for him to pick him up so that would she, that's not really their relationship in remake so that seems like more references to to the original game you know mm-hmm. like um and then hold on i think i had some other um yeah the connection yeah, but, the connection in remake in part one is probably yeah. it's probably not as strong as these lyrics would suggest yeah, it? yeah so it's it's very interesting um and i think that's i think that's the i think that's the, probably the correct interpretation um mm-hmm. and I, it's the very obvious one now I did say I would give a big stress theory just to humor people. Yeah, um, let's hear it. Maybe that he's addressing both Aerith and Zach because the thing does kick in while they're passing Zach's death site, you know, where he died. Mm. And, you know, and then Zach passes by them and they feel him, you know, like, you know, or at least Aerith feels them. So, and, you know, the song does reference like smiles a lot, and Zach was, you know, kind of a smiley character. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and you know, Zach was there to reach out to Cloud and you know help him become whole. So, like maybe, maybe I don't think that's true, but you know, it could be. I mean, they they are tying Zach into the story, so maybe that's kind of the subtle nod to it. Um, that the but when I read the original Japanese lyrics um, before they were translated, it seemed very much more overt that it was. Um, that it was about Aerith, and they even said something. There was even something in there about um, in the ja- original Japanese about her not or about her. He wants to hear her laugh again, mm. um, which in English they changed it to something about him asking her to smile. But the line, you know, is laughing again, and when she dies in the original game, he says something about him. Yeah. So like the original Japanese lyrics to me seem way more like she like like the song is totally about Aerith. But like, I got you. Okay, yeah. very. 
This this is such an interesting song, especially when you it read is. the lyrics. And I mean, these lyrics you said were uh, written by Nojima, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Nojima, who who was like the main scenario writer for right. remake. Yeah. Uwe Matsu composed the music. Yeah. So uh, very very interesting, man. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think that addresses pretty much everything. I mean, I we all we have our theories, but this was a, a music analysis, uh, so we're we're not going like super in depth with theories on this one. But uh, I hope you enjoyed our uh, our music analysis breakdown. Or this is from at sm pollard, and um, I encourage you guys to go to the Twitter account um, right there. You can you can see that link uh, or not the I'll put the link in the description for sure. sure. Um, but yeah, that right there that the Twitter handle below the the video tile. Um, go some show some love. Uh, you. you know show show him that he, you know tell him that he did a good job and all this other <laughs> stuff and give him a follow. Um, and let him know if you want if you want to hear more Absolutely. musical breakdowns like this. Uh, I for one. I, I really enjoyed this one. It looks like uh, Noon Wood <laughs> enjoyed it as well, uh, Polar. So I uh, give you the thumbs up there. And GG awesome. from, from Lexicon. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed this musical breakdown um, of Final Fantasy VII Remake music. I sure did. And, uh, Steven, thank you so much for being on Final Absolutely. Fan TV uh, and presenting uh, your findings here. I hope you had a good – did you have a good time, man? Did you oh, yeah, it? yeah, I loved it. And like, I, yeah. like, I, like I said before we started, I really do love this channel. Um, you know, with, with the Chocobo Band thing, like, God, God like, you're, you're doing things that other people aren't do- – yeah. <laughs> you're doing, you're like, you're doing content that I haven't really seen anybody else do, so I love that. But uh, so Appreciate I'm glad that you, that you had me on here. Like I said at the beginning, if any of you guys really want to hear more about this or want me to do other kind of deep dives into the music, you have to let me know because if I don't have an audience for it, I'm not going to do it. And my audience right now is pretty small, so you have to let me know. Uh, <laughs> Twitter, um, you know, or or YouTube comments, maybe like when this goes live. But. Yeah, uh, man. Well, I'm still I'm still on the uh, the bridge, man. I'm still on the bridge. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. I, I'm still- yeah. <laughs> I'm still on the bridge. I, I've been I've been thinking about it for two months, but I'm still on. I'm I like, just love it, man. The the, the Sephiroth and the opening, opening. just kind of tw- intertwining, fighting see, together. See, now now you have an excuse to go replay the game again to listen to all the music. Oh man! Like, oh crap! <laughs> you know I've played it for uh, this is I, fifth time I beat it. Um, so I, I've beat it five times, um, and. I kind of want to go back and play it again, regardless of my thoughts on this game. And you know how I feel, Steven. I know how you feel. We have similar, very similar feelings. Yeah. <laughs> very, almost, almost freakishly. Like, exactly. Um, and it could yeah. be it could be one of those things where, like, I don't know, man. I, I always I love to talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, not a lot of people love to hear it, so we just kind of, like, let it, yeah. let it go. But, um, sure. um, yeah, man, I would love to have you back on just to talk about that kind of stuff. It's another podcast. Maybe maybe one day, like, I'll get around to, like, looking at Intermission more deeply. I don't yeah, know. yeah, for real. Definitely, definitely. I, I did love Intermission. I that, Like, that made me feel a little bit better, so. Yeah, the, <laughs> the ending of Intermission, not the post-credits one or the, the, the after one, but the ending, the solid, man, the solid ending yeah. of Walking to Calm. Oh, it's so good. Yes. Yes, so good and it kind of like rejuvenated me i was it, it's it, to me it was like this is why this is why i'm going to keep playing this game for these little character moments they didn't do it there's there's not really any actual significance in that scene. it's just them walking and just talking walking. And, and hitchhiking and, but it's like i just love these character moments and well, I, I will come say, back i will come back to it like like every day like i will come back yeah, to it just for these characters just what, to see these characters see. interacting yeah and that that's what makes it like okay you know what i'm fine with you like spreading the story out because i i'm good oh yeah with, like, oh yeah like characters. yeah that was my first when they said they were gonna do multiple summons i'm like good maybe they'll give us more character interaction yeah. that was the main thing i wanted yeah so. absolutely man and so regardless of our thoughts about it man this was a lot of fun conversation it yes, still has us excited uh for for remake part two um regardless of our thoughts for part one um, we're still excited and, and i think that's mm-hmm. the beautiful thing about it um if not a little a little nervous as well so (laughs) a little apprehensive (laughs) yeah Yeah, exactly so anyways man this this has been a lot of fun thank you so much steven for being on the show absolutely thank you again so much for having me i hope everybody enjoyed it (laughs) thank you everyone for watching